I am really, really excited to introduce our next speaker. <clears throat> He's somebody I consider a dear friend and a mentor, and someone whose work has meant a tremendous amount to me personally. Um, <clears throat> if any of you are familiar with my book, and you, if you stick around until seven-ish tonight, you'll hear my particular story about how MAPS's work with MDMA <laughs> and post-traumatic stress disorder really saved my life at one point in time. Um, I cannot even begin to express the gratitude that I feel for this gentleman and all of the hard work that his team puts into this incredible pioneering research that they finally are able to do again after 40 some years of having it stuck underground. <clears throat> The topic of Rick's presentation today is psychedelics, science, medicine, spirituality, celebration, and harm reduction. What are the therapeutic methods of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for people with chronic post-traumatic stress disorder? Implemented by MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, He'll also explore the ways in which this approach relates to the psychedelic harm reduction that is practiced in the cosmic care here at Boom Festival and around the world. It is my distinct pleasure and honor, as I turn on my camera here, to introduce the executive director and founder of MAPS, Rick Doblin. Hey. <laughs> hey. Hey. Thank you all. Um, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here at Boom, where the future is being created. And what I've decided to do today is to start out by um, sharing our theory of social change and how psychedelics play a really crucial part in this uh, concept of social change that Boom is in many ways trying to create with the sustainability, with the building structures, with the openness to all sorts of um, energies, and that we're trying to create a vision of what life is like in a sustainable future and in a post-prohibition future. So I'll start with this, uh, our theory of social change, and then I'm going to speak to you about uh, where we're at with the psychedelic renaissance. And it, it reminds me of uh, a famous quote by um, Winston Churchill during... Um, World War II, and at one point he said, it's not, the end, uh, it's not the beginning of the end, but it's the end of the beginning. And so we are now at the end of the beginning of the renewal of psychedelic research that was squashed pretty much for 30 or 40 years. Then I'm going to speak more specifically about MDMA and our plans to develop MDMA into a treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder and also about our uh, therapy method and how we've described it and how we're learning to develop it and how we train therapists. And then I'm going to speak um, about once MDMA is a prescription medicine, how will it be implemented? What, we're all, we're, what will our society look like and how do we build a sustainable nonprofit? So that what MAPS is is basically a nonprofit pharmaceutical company. And we're working with drugs that have been abandoned by the pharmaceutical industry because they're off patent. So LSD, marijuana, MDMA, psilocybin, ayahuasca, all of these drugs, all the psychedelics are something that cannot be monopolized. And in most of their therapeutic uses, they're only meant to be given a few times in a longer process of psychotherapy. So the pharmaceutical companies have decided that this is not in any way something that they want to invest in, and in fact, they want to run away from it because a lot of these uh, therapies with psychedelics compete against pharmaceutical products that people need to take on a daily basis. And once you stop taking them, your symptoms come back. So we've had to say that it's not coming from the pharmaceutical companies. It's not coming from governments because right now support from government is into demonizing these drugs. And so we've been blessed in a way, I call, I call it the Aikido strategy, is that governments have spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars on what's wrong with illegal drugs. So that if you go into Medline right now, which is the index of the world scientific literature, and you put in MDMA or ecstasy, you'll get over 4,600 papers. And these have been produced at a cost of over $300 million. 
So we have an enormous body of information about MDMA that we don't need to pay for, but it's all about the risk side. We also have the advantage of tens and hundreds of millions of people having tried these drugs over the last you know, 30 to 50 years. And so the weird side effects that can occur when somebody drinks too much water and dies from hyponatremia or somebody overheats at a rave, that we know about all these weird side effects. And when the FDA normally evaluates a drug, they only have a few hundred to a few thousand people that receive the drug. So how do they know about the one in 50,000 side effects, somebody dies from this or that? They don't. And that's why you hear about a lot of drugs that are removed from the market after they've been approved. But with psychedelics and with marijuana, we don't have that situation because we have all of this uh, non-medical informal testing that many of us have uh, been blessed to participate in. And the risk profile of these drugs are extremely well known. So at the same time, we've not been able to get support from the major foundations. It's just a little bit too controversial. Um, I was um, in England at a conference, the Breaking Convention, uh, about a year and a half ago, which was a great conference. And one of the reasons I went was to go see people at the Wellcome Trust. There had been an article about an art exhibit that they had put on um, called um, um, High Society. And it was about art throughout the centuries of uh, depicting scenes of people getting high. And it was in their headquarters. And so I started um, thinking about who was this Wellcome Trust, because the article also had somebody from the Home Office in England saying that they would approve MDMA research. And so I found out that the Wellcome Trust was the largest foundation in England that had $20 billion in assets. And they were funded by initially a pharmaceutical company, Burroughs Wellcome. And they were focused on neuroscience in large part. So I had a meeting with them, and their response was, this is a reputational risk for us to get involved. And I said, this is a reputational opportunity for you to get involved. Because if you're the first to really support this research in a major way, and it turns out that there are really benefits that we can demonstrate here, people will look very highly on what you've done and on your courage. And unfortunately, they ended up leaning back towards it's a reputational risk. So it hasn't come from major foundations, and support has come from basically the psychedelic community and people within it who have resources, family foundations, and we have thousands of members that have given 25 or $35, and all of that adds up. I mean, there was one week where I got a, a, a check for $250,000, and I got a letter that had eight stamps from a drug war prisoner who wanted us to use those stamps to further our mission. So I felt really touched that we all just do our part, and I think, and it'll all come together. So we are at this um, end of the beginning, and the theory of social change is basically that there is a sort of consciousness crisis going on in the world, and through globalization, through all of us coming together, isolated cultures, isolated religions, groups that were able to live without having their value systems challenged or confronted by others, are now being mixed more together. And we're seeing with global warming, with the, the stresses on the food, the planetary resources, that we're understanding that more and more it's a one planetary system. And the shots of Earth from outer space, they're all about this process of recognizing that we have to have global solutions. And that doesn't mean that individual variations have to be all washed out. We can actually appreciate the differences once we know deep down that we're fundamentally similar or identical, that it's not our country or our religion or our um, race, our wealth, our culture, our, our gender, all the different ways that we might identify our tribe, who we are, that there's something fundamentally deeper than that, which is part of the human planet, the part of this earth. And that if you can have that experience not just intellectually, but if you can anchor that experience and, and own it, then that has political implications. So I think that is the big picture. It's not so much about drugs for psychedelics for treating medicines, although that's very important. But the reason that I've devoted myself to trying to mainstream psychedelics, to bring them up from 
uh, the underground, bringing them back into culture, is because I think that they're incredibly powerful tools, and we have relatively short period of time, and that when used appropriately, these tools can help people break through their various defenses and their various identifications into this deeper mystical sense of community. And I think that's what is going to help prevent the kind of atrocities that we've seen in the past, where people are demonized and scapegoated. So it was my, uh, born in 53, in a Jewish family, really very much uh, taught about Hitler and the death camps. And that somehow or other, I, I internalized that as a mission to try to figure out how to respond to social insanity. And I think part of it is this scapegoating. And unfortunately, drugs and drug users have also become scapegoated. And we have horrific penalties for things that shouldn't be a crime. And in fact, when we talk about psychedelics as having uh, the potential to facilitate spiritual experiences, you can look at it in the form of a human right. That there's, in the United States Constitution, there's the right to free speech. There's the right of the press. There's the right to assemble. And underneath, there's the freedom of religion. And underneath all of these is the right to think, the right to explore your own consciousness in order for you to have these opinions to share. And since psychedelics are tools to open us to our different aspects of ourself, our unconscious, that it's a fundamental human right to have these drugs accessible. And so I think that is the profound dilemma that we face ourselves in a prohibition world that is trying to squash these things, except for isolated places like Boom. And so Boom is the world's best example of psychedelic harm reduction for non-medical use. And it's just a, an honor, I think, the way in which uh, Diogo and other of the Boom organizers have decided to prioritize cosmic care and energy control, the way that drugs are being tested on site, that would be completely illegal in the United States. So that this is an example of trying to bring forward in a way where large numbers of people, particularly younger people, can have experiences of bonding, of connection. There's people from 100 countries here. So that it's in, an incredible situation. And what we're trying to demonstrate is that in a post-prohibition world, it's possible to have this sort of freedom and yet have responsibility, have teams that will help people that get into trouble. Because people will inevitably, as they're exploring their psyche, reach difficult points. And sometimes people will need support for that. And so that's what Cosmic Care is providing, and that's what Boom is trying to make as an example. So that this um, sense of psychedelics as offering the potential for spiritual experience, there was um, Albert Hoffman, I mean, well, uh, Albert Einstein said that the splitting of the atom has changed everything except our mode of thinking, and hence we drift towards unparalleled catastrophe. What shall be required if mankind is to survive is a whole new mode of thinking. And trying to understand what Einstein was saying, I think that mode of thinking is a more collectivist, a more sense of connection, particularly what he was discovering with quantum physics and others, and that we are all really connected. But we need to come from that place. The UNESCO charter says, uh, since wars begin in the minds of men, it's in the minds of men that the defenses of peace must be constructed. So we need to look at our, the roots of aggression, the roots of fear and, and projection, and try to both work on an individual level and a broader cultural level. And psychedelics are tools for that. And I, had, um, I discovered MDMA in 1982. I mean, that sounds bad. I didn't discover MDMA. Um, I mean, I learned about MDMA after others had, um, it was, this is the 100th anniversary, by the way, of the real discovery of MDMA. It was invented in 1912. <laughs> yeah, and um, it's also the 100th anniversary of the Oreo cookie. And so now, more dollars are spent on MDMA ecstasy than on Oreo cookies. <laughs> so that we are trying to say that, in, in, that, um, I, so I learned in 1982 about MDMA, and I read a book in 83 by Robert Mueller, who is the Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations. And this was a book called New Genesis, Shaping a Global Spirituality. And what his basic thesis was is that we have the United Nations to try to mediate between conflicts between countries. And 
it doesn't work so smoothly, but at least it helps somewhat. But what he was recognizing is that underneath a lot of the international conflict between countries are religious conflicts. And he felt that what we needed was a united religions. Again, not that every religion becomes one, but that there is an appreciation of the other religions and also that we explore the idea of a common spirituality, the perennial philosophy that Aldous Huxley talked about, that there is something that seems um, in common between the mystics of the different religions. And in fact, the mystics of the religions are closer to each other than they are to the fundamentalists in their own religions. So we need a deepening of religious process. We see out of fear a, a retreat to fundamentalism going on in a lot of the world. And I think that that's actually a sign that the grip on my way is the only way, you know, only way to get to heaven, that those kind of fundamentalist structures are, are losing strength and they're sort of retreating. And this um, globalization is, is developing and this global spirituality that I think one of the examples is, is boom. So what Robert Mueller wrote about was that we need to understand how is there this common core and, and he believed that there was. And so I, I wrote him a letter, I was just an undergraduate at the time, and I said that I appreciated what he had to say, but he didn't say anything at all about psychedelics in his book. And since psychedelics could help us study mystical experiences, would he help open the door to psychedelic research? And to my shock, he wrote me a handwritten letter back saying that I understood what he wrote and he would help. And then he gave a list of about six or eight um, religious professionals, mystics in different religions, and suggested that I contact them. So I kind of read between the lines, and I heard him saying, send them MDMA. <laughs> so I proceeded to send them MDMA. And it was legal at the time, and we had a Roman Catholic monk use MDMA in a monastery as half dose for meditation. We had Zen monks use it in lengthy meditation retreats. We had uh, Orthodox rabbis uh, use it in initiation ceremonies. Free-thinking Orthodox rabbis. <laughs> and then they would report back to Robert Mueller. So all of this helped to confirm in me the idea that this, is, this theory of social change is true. But I still wanted one other check on it. And so I did a 25-year follow-up to the Good Friday experiment. So if you could raise your hands if you know about the Good Friday experiment. Okay, most of you don't, but some of you do. So I'll be very brief, but this was probably the best thing that Timothy Leary did before he got kicked out of Harvard. <laughs> and what, what it was was um, a study of 20 divinity students, Christian divinity students, going into chapel on Good Friday. And before the service, half of them got psilocybin mushrooms in capsules and half got a placebo. And to show you how accepted this was at the time, before the 60s really exploded, the minister was Reverend Howard Thurman, and he was Martin Luther King's mentor at Boston University, where Martin Luther King was getting his PhD. Also, uh, prior to this, I'd spoken to an early psychedelic uh, researcher from the late 50s to say that the Pope sent his uh, a nun confessor to the United States to learn about LSD research with the possible idea of how could they incorporate it. And then the Pope died before anything really happened. But the Good Friday experiment took three and a half hours or so in church. And then there was questionnaires that had been developed to isolate what are the core common features of a mystical experience. The most important one being uh, a sense of unity, a sense of um, being in the presence of something sacred, uh, transcendence of time and space, uh, so the questionnaire was stripped of anything that linked to a particular religion. So even though it was on Good Friday, there was no, did you have images of Jesus? None of that was in there. And the questionnaire revealed that nine out of the 20 had a uh, full or partial mystical experience. And eight out of those nine had the psilocybin. So 25 years later, I tracked uh, them down. I found 19 out of the 20 and was able to um, interview them all in person. And one of them um, w was able to say that, um, the one of the first ones, that that mystical experience led him to lose, to some degree, his fear of death, 
and to participate more in the civil rights struggle in the United States. Others talked about working in the environmental movement. Others talked about trying to stop the MX missile basing in uh, Montana and elsewhere. So people got more involved in Vietnam uh, protests. So from this follow-up, this was the final confirmation I needed that people who had had this mystical experience in a non-politicized time 25 years later, in the midst of the Reagan, Nancy Reagan, just say no, that they reaffirmed the value of their psychedelic experience as genuinely mystical, and said that it had contributed to them getting more involved in making life and making the world more what they uh, idealistically wanted it to be. So that's this underlying value on why we do all this different research and all this effort to try to bring psychedelics back for medical conditions uh, initially because I think our culture is more open to medicine. But the deeper goal is, in a way, to have opportunities for people collectively, individually, to have these spiritual experiences. So it's kind of freedom from religion to say that each of us has the right to have our own direct connection, and if psychedelics are helpful, that that's something that we should have the opportunity to do. So that is what underlies. The, the other part, one other part of this is that um, Culture change takes generations. And about um, 2001, I taught a class at the college that I went to. And I had been starting to worry that the, it, as it was becoming clear that progress was incredibly slow, that I, I was starting to worry that the younger generation would think that the interest in psychedelics was just something of the hippies and that they crashed and burned, and that our efforts would be seen as sort of ridiculous, naive, and that our efforts would, would fail. But teaching that course and being here and all sorts of other experiences have led me to, to see that there is this missing generation during the whole time that the crackdown was happening, the research was blocked, but that the younger generations are open in ways that are really profound to psychedelic experiences. And so I, I think that the kind of, I talked about Winston Churchill and the, uh, you know, the end of the beginning, but I think coming to the end where psychedelics are fully integrated in society is a 30, 40 year process. And it will be most of your uh, generation that will make it happen. We're gonna do it, bring it as far as we can, but we're not gonna make it completely. So I'm really re um, reassured that to see um, how this is being picked up. And, and why I should have worried in the first place kind of came to me as ridiculous, because when you look at these drugs, they've been used for thousands of years by peyote, by the, um, by the Native American church, that's new, but ayahuasca back thousands of years. All these drugs have been used for thousands of years. So there is a way where it continues to replicate into the next generation. Now, the other um, theory of social change here is that there is so much misinformation about psychedelics and about marijuana that people are scared, parents in particular, scared of their, ki of their kids getting involved in these drugs, that there is an enormous reservoir of fear. And the prohibition is actually, we, we talk here about harm reduction. Well, prohibition is harm maximization. It's an intentional strategy to make drugs as risky as possible so that there are tragedies, so that then people get scared of it, and then that reinforces this prohibitionist urge. So how do we overcome all that? One of the things that is so useful that we can use as leverage in our society is science and the media. So when you do studies, these get out, and then you get all this millions of dollars worth of free media. And that can help to counteract. So what we um, notice in the United States is that the polling that looks at people's attitudes towards legalizing marijuana for the last 40 years, they crossed this point um, just last year. The end of last year was the first time that 50%, more than 50% said marijuana should be legal. And if you... You look at the chart for where this started really changing, it was 1996. And what changed in the US in 96 was the first medical marijuana law in California and in Arizona. And so we see that the medicalization of these drugs makes a major difference in people's perceptions of their risks. 
And a polling was recent. There's um, initiatives that are being on the ballot in Colorado and the state of Washington to legalize marijuana completely. And the polling shows that there is one factor that predicts more than anything else whether somebody is in favor of legalizing marijuana. And the surprising thing, it's not whether you use marijuana yourself. It, it's not whether you've been arrested for marijuana. It's whether you know a medical marijuana patient. So that people are confused by all the information that they get. And when they can actually see for themselves through a friend that, that this is helping, all things get rearranged in their mind. So we've got a great um, example there that through the medicalization of marijuana, we are changing people's attitudes. And so that's another reason why I think focusing scarce resources on developing the medical potential of psychedelics is a good idea for this broader social change. Now, where we're at with the psychedelic renaissance, there's five different basic um, areas of research. Um, three of them are medical. One is looking at uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And I'll talk about that a bit, a bit later in more detail. Another is working with people at end of life who have cancer or other indications. And it's psychedelics to help people deal with the anxiety related to dying. And so what we're doing strategically, and I'll, uh, I'll just mention that I, I got my PhD from Harvard, from the Kennedy School of Government, and my master's, focusing on uh, regulation of um, psychedelics and marijuana. So I was like the uh, affirmative action lefty liberal that they let in for that year. And so I've been trained sort of to work strategically and to be able to work with people that are dying. People are more scared of dying than they are of drugs. And if you can use drugs to help them have a more peaceful death, they're willing to listen. And so there's a whole train of research that's being done at uh, UCLA, NYU, New York University, Johns Hopkins University. We completed a study in Switzerland with LSD for end of life that are gathering some promising information. Now, this goes back to some of the early research in the late 60s, 70s with LSD with cancer patients. So we're just 40 plus years later picking up this thread. But it's a very, very important one. And then the third main medical area is in the treatment of addiction. And part of this is to show that we are understanding that drugs aren't all benefits. There's benefits and risks to drugs. And if we can be acknowledging that and working directly to use psychedelics to help people with addiction problems, that sends a powerful message. It's unlikely that that will be the first uh, drug, uh, psychedelic uh, clinical condition that will make it through the FDA, but it's important to keep that. And there's studies with ayahuasca, um, in the treatment of uh, cocaine addiction being done um, in Peru at Takawasi. There's studies that we just finished up in British Columbia with ayahuasca working with First Nations people. So it's kind of unusual. Peruvian shamans coming up to uh, Canada to work with native cultures who have terrible problems with addiction bringing ayahuasca. We're also doing research with Ibogaine and the treatment of uh, opiate addiction with a study uh, going to finish the one-year follow-up in September, done in Mexico, and we have one in New Zealand also. So those are the three main medical areas. Um, and then there's two others. One is uh, neuroscience. And there's a fair amount of research that's being conducted now in England, uh, in Switzerland, the University of Zurich, that's looking with modern techniques as to what these drugs actually do in the brain and how they work. And that's really important, but from the narrow point of trying to make drugs into medicines, the FDA and the health authorities, you don't have to explain how a drug works. You just have to show that it works to get it approved. Because understanding the mechanism is really complicated. So the FDA just says, you just really have to show me that there's a favorable risk benefit, and then it can be a medicine. So we've not put any of our scarce resources into neuroscience research, but it's happening and it's really giving a much better understanding. One of the biggest studies that came out recently was a study in England with psilocybin and fMRI. And the thought previously had been that psilocybin LSD stimulates blood flow in the brain and it sort of activates your circuits and that you're able to perceive more. And that was sort of the operating theory for the last 30 years. And it shows the value of science because what the research showed was completely the opposite, that psilocybin suppresses blood flow in certain areas of your brain, but they're the filtering areas of your brain. And when your filtering is suppressed, you get a flood of 
perceptions and senses. So you feel more like everything's connected because part of your brain is limiting things down so that you can deal with it. So that's a really important area. Um, and then the other area is in spirituality directly, looking at whether um, psilocybin and other drugs can contribute to a mystical experience. And there was a tremendous study done at Johns Hopkins tried in a way to replicate Good Friday. But what they did was they didn't have a group of people that were ministers. They didn't put it in a religious setting. They didn't have it during a religious service. They had individuals from a, a, who were not religious professionals in a hospital setting individually taking psilocybin. And most of them said it was the top five uh, spiritual experiences of their life. And many of them said the, some of the most important experience of their whole life. So what this shows is that you do not need a religion. You do not need a group. That there is this, I mean, you can get support from those things. But there is this innate capacity that we have when we're feeling safe to have a, a spiritual mystical experience. And that's why I'm saying that it's a fundamental human right to be able to explore these things outside of a religious context on individual context. All right. So we have... Um, Yeah. And, and more and more people are coming to see that. So that we now have um, basically the ability to get psychedelic research approved anywhere, pretty much anywhere in the world. Not exactly. Russia forbids it right now. Um, China, it would be very difficult. Uh, Portugal, it would probably be possible. We're pretty uh, good at getting permission. Now, things go slowly. We're, we're spending... Um, two years in Canada, but we're nearing the end, it seems, to negotiate on um, the security arrangements for $1,500 worth of MDMA. We're having to bulletproof glass this entire pharmacy, building a safe, you know, building a cabinet around the safe so it doesn't look like a safe, alarming it all to the um, police station and everywhere. And it's gone on and on and on. But we're, we're coming close so that we are at this um, transition point. And I'm thinking that there the one area of backlash is the potential for the fear to be so exaggerated again by lots and lots of young people having tragic experiences. And one of the reasons that MAPS that we've gotten involved with trying to develop and help people develop models like Cosmic Care and like what we've done at Burning Man is to develop kind of a, a demonstration model that both in the short run does reduce some of these potentials for catastrophes, particularly if it gets spread in other festivals, and also shows the way towards a, a post-prohibition world. So that's where we're at. And uh, uh, we had one member of our board of, advise, board of directors who was um, a software, brilliant software inventor. Around half of the computer chips in the world are manufactured with his software. And he, he died um, at age 62. And he left MAPS $5 million for MDMA research. So it's probably $15, $18 million. But the idea that we can make MDMA into a medicine is now more realistic than it's ever been. And so how do we go about doing that? I spent a long time trying to figure out what is the best combination of psychedelic drug and clinical condition. And uh, many of you may know that MDMA is great for relationships or couples therapy. It's really helpful for that. But couples uh, having a difficult time is not a disease. It, it's not something that you can go to the FDA and say their relationship is better, now it should be a medicine. So also what we've found is that for therapists to be effective, to be most effective in working with patients, it helps if they've done the drug themselves. So if you were to want to learn yoga, you would probably go to somebody that knows how to do yoga. And if, if you want to do meditation, you would probably go to somebody that meditated. And so if you want to go to somebody that is going to be a psychedelic therapist, you might want to know that they had their own experience. So I think from what's happened to modern psychiatry these days, where it's become basically an arm of the pharmaceutical industry, and people are focusing just on 15-minute uh, interviews, client interviews, patient interviews, and then medicating. And they don't do therapy anymore at all. So that there is this um, kind of lack of understanding of the whole inner dynamic. There used to be psychoanalysis, but psychoanalysis has been rightly discredited 
for not being scientific, for being too culture bound. So which drug do we bring into psychiatry and psychotherapy first? And I think MDMA is gentler, shorter acting, it's less of a move towards uh, non-rational states than any of the classic psychedelics. So for that reason, it, it made it seem to me that MDMA would be the drug most likely to make it, despite the enormous demonization of MDMA, which we know to be a, a vast exaggeration. So I felt we could overcome that, and we can speak to uh, psychiatrists and psychotherapists, and they won't be so scared at the implications that they should have their own experiences. So that, that's how we came to MDMA. Then post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, MDMA reduces uh, blood flow in the amygdala, the left amygdala, which is where fear emotions are processed. It enhances uh, blood flow in the prefrontal cortex, and it uh, promotes prolactin and oxytocin release, which are the hormones of bonding. And uh, Dr. Torsen Passi has actually compared MDMA to the post-orgasmic state. And if you think about it, um, it's very similar in the hormonal release and in the attitudes. You're peaceful, you're not striving, you're open. And so to bring this kind of an experience to people that are traumatized. The other part of this is that people who have post-traumatic stress disorder are not the other. People who have drug addiction problems are the other. People who are dying from cancer are all of us. And with PTSD, the incredible crisis that we've had in the United States because of the um, misguided wars that we've had in Iraq and Afghanistan, that we have a, a national crisis of post-traumatic stress disorder. Last year, the Veterans Administration spent five and a half billion dollars just on disability payments to about uh, 275,000 vets. That's on one year, five and a half billion dollars, and that's repeated over and over and over, and it's growing. So we felt that by working both uh, with MDMA and with post-traumatic stress disorder, with um, women who've been raped, with childhood sexual abuse, with veterans, with firefighters and police who traumatized from their work, that that would help us cross this cultural barrier. The other issue with working with people that are dying is that there is um, an intervening variable, which is their health status. So that in our Swiss study, we had somebody in the control group who had um, a low dose, but his cancer was cured and his anxiety went way down. So that you have something that affects your primary outcome measure that's independent of the therapy. And in large numbers, those can wash out, but it seems that for several reasons, the other part is that the sort of experience you have, this unit of state as you prepare, as you're dying, the kind of experience isn't mapped exactly on the standard anxiety and depression measures. So it's a little harder to map social ch the, the progress that people have made on the measures that FDA uses. So for all those reasons, we've chosen MDMA for post-traumatic stress disorder. And I think that's been the, the, the right choice. We have a paper um, that we published in the Journal of Psychopharmacology from our first study, 20 subjects. And the process was most of them had uh, uh, about half of them had two MDMA sessions, and the other half had three MDMA sessions, each three to five weeks apart. And there's um, three preparation sessions. They have the MDMA session. They spend the night in the treatment facility. Uh, they have an integrative session the next day. They're called on the phone every day for a week for further conversations. They have psychotherapy in person once a week for three more weeks while they integrate the experience, and then they're ready for their second MDMA session. You know, and if they're still working on integrating, we can prolong that between three to five weeks. Right? And then they have the second and then the third. And then two months after that, we test them with the CAPS, the Clinician Administered PTSD Scale, which was developed by the US military. And it's the one that has been used by FDA to approve Zoloft and Paxil. So it's the gold standard measure. And that's what we use. And so what we showed is that 80% of the people who had post-traumatic stress disorder for an average of 20 years no longer had PTSD at the end of the treatment. Now, the, the, the team of therapists was uh, tremendous, trained by Stan Groff, the world's leading LSD therapist, who's developed holotropic breath work, and we're sort of all his students and disciples, most of us working in this area right now. Um, but what we showed is with the inactive placebo, the 
CAMP scores totally went down 50 points. With the inactive placebo, they went down 20 points. And then we let people go through this whole thing again after they had did this, if they wanted to, and with full dose MDMA. And then it went down another 30 points. So it went down 50 points that way. And the people that started with the MDMA went down 50 points right away. So what I'm trying to say is that roughly, and this is hard to say, but roughly 40% is coming from the therapy, the therapists, and 60% is coming from the MDMA itself. That there's, it's not that this is limited to a few great therapists. That there are uh, a lot of impact that the quality of therapy can make, that the context can make, but that the MDMA itself has incredible power used in this way. So what we've just done, and we're about to publish in September, is a three and a half year follow-up to this initial study. And you almost never have long-term follow-ups lasting three and a half years. But it took us so long to do the study that we decided that we would wait till the end and then do the follow-up. And we were able to find almost everybody. And what we found is that the results, on average, have sustained over time. So it's not an MDMA delusion. It's not the, after, the psychedelic afterglow that people are sort of coasting and then reality comes back. There's something fundamental has changed as a result of MDMA PTSD therapy when it works well. And what we're hoping eventually is that neuroscience research will tell us what's going on in the brain, where that happens. And what we predict will be new neural pathways routing around the amygdala to the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is where you put things in context so that people are triggered by uh, little things that remind them of the trauma. And even if it's out of context, even if they're safe, like a soldier that hears a loud noise, you know, from a streetcar or something like that, that you can, but, and those pathways are just rapid from the sound of the fear. And you, under MDMA, you can start differentiating those. So hopefully one day we'll be able to show that there are, you know, physiological correlates of the therapeutic change, but we're not quite there yet. But what we've been able to show is that there are long-term changes in most people. Now, some people relapsed. It's not like you can work on your problems and then life doesn't matter what life throws at you. Particularly those people that develop post-traumatic stress disorder, 90% of the people that ha are traumatized don't get PTSD, they recover. And the ones that tend to get chronic treatment-resistant PTSD are the ones that have had a history of trauma before that. Not always, but, but mostly. So what we showed is that a few people did relapse. And so we went to the FDA and we said, we would like to be able to see if one more MDMA session can help people get back to where they were before. And we don't want to do it a double blind. We just want to have everybody know we're giving them full dose MDMA, what's called open label. And the FDA said yes. And we've worked now with one of the two people that relapsed, and they are now back to where they were before. The, the other thing that we did to the FDA is that we said, as we spread out, uh, we're going to want to train therapists. And there's only so many that have underground credentials and above ground credentials. And to mainstream these things, we're going to need to find the people that have mainstream credentials but don't have the psychedelic experience. And how can we, do, how can we give them an MDMA experience? We need to do it in some sort of a protocol since it's a Schedule I drug. And so the FDA said that uh, we need a compromise here. They said you can't just, uh, we can't just give you a permission to give it to them, but if you can design a study that gathers some information, we'll let you limit it to who's in the study to therapists in your training program. And so we were able to do that and get permission from FDA, from the Institutional Review Board, and even from the DEA. And so now we've been able to bring in therapists from around the world and give them an MDMA session. So we have a mechanism for now training. And that shows again how in the United States, FDA is science over politics. But the situation is not the same with marijuana. So we're trying to do a marijuana post-traumatic stress disorder study. And a lot of veterans use marijuana. It helps them sleep through the night. They don't remember their nightmares. There's lots of people using it. But marijuana is more about treating symptoms than a cure. So we're primarily interested in MDMA, but we're also interested in marijuana. And we have FDA permission, but in the United States, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, which funds 80% of the drug abuse research in the world, have, they have a monopoly on the supply of marijuana that you can use in research. 
And if you want to find out what's bad with marijuana, you know, they'll send it to you with a check <laughs> for your study. If you want to find out what's good with marijuana, it's very difficult. So we've been in litigation against the DEA and we're waiting from a, a First Circuit Court of Appeals. We won an administrative law judge hearing uh, saying that it would be in the public interest for us to get our own farm. So we're trying to start our own medical marijuana farm at UMass Amherst. Um, and so again, these are the kind of things that make me say that it's not going to happen all in my generation because I, I spent seven years trying to buy 10 grams of marijuana for vaporizer research. We're the only people in America that cannot find 10 grams of pot after trying for seven years. None of the pot that's grown in the States counts. It has to be grown under DEA license. And this was for vaporizer research. And the reason that vaporizer research is such a threat is because there's this big concern about marijuana as a medicine, no medicines are smoked. But vaporization doesn't burn the marijuana. It just heats it up and you get a steam. So we did the first study with water pipes and vaporizers and found that water pipes don't really um, do much of anything in terms of the particulate matter that they filter out. You look at bong water and it's you know disgusting, but you think something good is going on. But you've got just as much gunk as cannabinoids in there. So the ratio of the stuff that comes out is the same as stuff that goes in. So we now need to, if we want to reduce the particulate matter, work on vaporization. But what's also happened at UCLA with Dr. Donald Tashkin and others is that the research has been shockingly uh, positive and has shown that marijuana does not cause lung cancer. And in fact, marijuana has a protective effect. The cannabinoids have a protective effect on cancer. And they're being explored in all different ways, in large doses, more than you would get from smoking on certain kind of brain tumors, skin tumors. So I believe a rational risk benefit would show that uh, the marijuana smoke could become a medicine. But we're trying to do vaporizer research. So we're still in this place where um, there's no medical grade marijuana that we can use. The only one is Bedrocan in Dutch in the Netherlands and they don't want to export to the United States. So we're still in, in litigation. But with psychedelics, surprisingly, we have an open door. Now, there was just a new law that was passed uh, July 9th, um, Food and Drug Safety and Innovation Act. And what it does is it provides special incentives to pharmaceutical companies to develop drugs, particularly those that are for life-threatening illness. And PTSD is something that ha people have a higher rate of suicide. And you can apply for special procedures and you can uh, expedite uh, the drug development. And what we're looking towards, we now guess, is a roughly eight year period of time that would um, be required for us to finish our phase two studies. We have to figure out how to do a double blind study. What's the exact method? Is it two sessions? Is it three sessions? It's, um, you'll find out from um, listening to this talk coming up about cosmic care, the approach towards treating people at cosmic care is very similar to the therapeutic approach. That what we're finding is that there is uh, a lot of things that we're still having to learn. It's going to take us another couple years. Then we have what's called an end of phase two meeting. And you propose to FDA your big phase three studies. Those will take us like five years to do. So we're like eight years out. They'll sit on it for a year or so. So if all goes well, and rarely it does, but maybe it will, we should have MDMA as a prescription medicine in about a decade. And I think these other me medicines will come along as well. Now, how do we build a sustainable nonprofit? So what I've said initially is that MAPS is a um, nonprofit pharmaceutical company. So that means that we will be the ones that sell the drug. Now, because they're not patented, there will be competition. But I recently learned something that I thought I knew everything about the FDA process, but I recently learned that there was something fundamental that I had missed, and it's been around since 86, which is that if you're the first to make a, a medicine, something into a medicine, even if it's off patent, even if there are no use patents, you will get five years exclusive right to market. So that means that if MAPS makes MDMA into a medicine, there's a five-year period where we're the only ones that can sell it for PTSD. Now, because again, we're a nonprofit, we give our data away. It's all on our website. If any pharmaceutical company or anybody wanted to try to beat us to make the uh, MDMA into a medicine, we would say, here's the data. I would, I'll just 
swim more in the lake, <laughs> get high and swim. You know, so I don't, um, I'm not fearful that somebody will do that. I hope somebody will do that. I don't expect it, but we, we put all our data in the public domain. So there's this five year period. Now, the FDA has all of these rules too about risky drugs. And what we're talking about is MDMA assisted psychotherapy with the psychotherapy being of a certain kind that we have written up in a manual. All of our sessions are videotaped, audio taped. The therapists are graded on how well they comply to the method and they have to comply above a certain point so we can bundle all the data together from what will be 30 or 40 different sites. And from this whole uh, process, the FDA is going to say that not every doctor can prescribe MDMA, only ones that have been through the training. And the training would be from us because we have the responsibility as the sponsor. Now, once somebody has gotten our training and they can prescribe it, they can prescribe it what's called off-label meaning that that's a fundamental principle of medicine. The doctors can make individual decisions based on their patients, and they could modify it. So you could have somebody from a Roman Catholic tradition trying to make MDMA, uh, you know, in a, you know, like a Catholic hospice and help people that way. So all of these things will be possible. So once MDMA becomes a medicine for PTSD, it can be prescribed for all sorts of things. But there would be these requirements for the training, which would then become a business for MAPS, and then we would also be selling the MDMA. And then the third thing is that we would open up um, a chain of psychedelic clinics. And these would become like a model for how this could be done. Other people can open up their own clinics. So these are our ways that we're speaking to potential donors, that we're not like a traditional nonprofit that feeds the hungry and there's an endless supply of hungry people. And you know what we're trying to say is that we have several income streams that come and that those can be used to fund further research instead of being taken out as profits. And you could imagine that if we get marijuana ever made as a medicine, um, in Israel, medical marijuana is um, legal. There are large scale production. There's over uh, 10,000 patients and they're able to produce marijuana, high potency trim buds for 50 cents a gram, which is astonishing. So. Uh, so I, I think that we have this idea of a sustainable nonprofit that will continue to, and pharmaceutical companies are looking at all the different ways to take apart the marijuana molecule and work with cannabinoids and charge you higher prices. So there always needs to be a nonprofit that's focused on patient care, getting it for the least cost, letting patients grow their own. So that's, that's our overall big plan. And if there's time for questions, do you know what time it is? Where are we at? Where are we at? Uh, I'm sorry. Well, I, I um, will just hang around, and I would love to speak to whoever you have questions, and it's uh, great to see all of you here, and we are collectively building the future. And um, this uh, Maria and Svia are going to come speak to you about uh, cosmic care, and I think it's an enormously uh, wonderful thing that's being done here. And it's, um, it's difficult, but I think it makes everybody feel safer, and it, it's really great. So um, there's an announcement. Um, just that we're having. Oh, okay. So we're having a big international conference, April 18th to 22nd, 2013, in Oakland, bringing all the major psychedelic researchers from around the world to Oakland for a, a, a five-day conference, three-day conference, and one-day workshops before and after. So you're all invited to come. It's, it'll be a little bit more. Um, Rick, we have a question here. Oh, good. Oh. Oh, bad. Hello. Okay. So since a lot of people are on... <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I don't think we have time. We'll, I'm we'll sorry. Just have to do this. We're out of time okay, right now, just, and we do come? need to end Bye. the session. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then this is just one one minute announcement. Okay. Go ahead. Yes, please. All right. All right. Thanks for the attention. Uh, Rick just mentioned the conference that MAPS will be organizing, but we'll be organizing a conference in Amsterdam as well. I know that Ben already mentioned it, but I'd like to uh, repeat the message. Um, the conference will be in Amsterdam on the 6th and 7th of October and we'll be addressing um, roughly all the topics that uh, both Ben de Lunen and Rick have mentioned. I will be talking on um, the therapeutic applications of uh, psychedelics, uh, about neuroscientific research, um, well, and uh, every possible uh, scientific discipline possible. Um, if you want more information, um, I think at the MAPS booth there will be posters 
Um, and if you can remember, have a look at the website, mindalteringscience.com, um, where you can find all the other information about the conference. Thank you. All right, everybody, let's give a round of applause for Rick Doblin. Yeah. Yeah. Nice job, man.